to your feet, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, this weekend, being Memorial Day weekend, we do remember those who have given the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedoms. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of their lives. God, we honor their, their memory. And Lord, we will use our freedoms to continue to preach the gospel, to continue to move forward with the things of God in our lives. And so, God, we're grateful. Lord, we would ask for all those, maybe this weekend is a tough weekend, as they remember the loss, God, and the pain and the hurt, the emptiness, God. I pray, Lord, that you would fill that with your presence. That, God, that you would wrap the everlasting arms around each and every one of them and comfort their hearts today, God. Lord, God, we do pray for our military. God, we pray for our leaders, Lord. We ask your protection, your wisdom, God, your direction, Lord, that you continue to make this land a land that honors you, God, a place where we can freely open the word and proclaim the gospel truth. God, we thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we have, God. And Lord, we know that ultimately that Jesus Christ is the one who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, God, that we wouldn't be bound in sin any longer, that we could live in your wonderful, expansive freedom, God, that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And so, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. Today, Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly, today we have not come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher of the church. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, we'll give you praise and glory and honor for it. Today, God, we don't just ask this blessing of your presence and your power, your word on our behalf. God, we'd ask it on behalf of all of our brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world, Lord, denominational, non-denominational, God, doesn't matter. Lord, persecuted church scattered abroad throughout the nations, we bless all of our brothers and sisters. Watch over them. Oh, great shepherd of the sheep, direct them. Uh, May your presence be with them. Uh, Father God, moving them forward as you're moving us forward, Lord, giving your leading, your guidance, Lord. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen, amen. Today, have a seat and get your Bibles out. Today, uh, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter number six. We're going to start in Matthew, chapter number six. We're taking a sidestep for four weeks, actually five weeks with the birthday celebration uh, from Colossians, and we're just going to do something that we've done every year for the past several years. We believe that the subject that we're going to cover is very important for all of us. You know, when you go line upon line and precept upon precept, you're going to cover certain topics just because you have to. They're in the verses. But there are other topics that I believe that are very important for the church to have a good understanding and to know what it is that the Word of God has to say about it because it involves something in our life. We do this every year because this is something that we see that is prevalent in the Word. This is something that we see that is, is conspicuous, if you will. It's, it's very open. Uh, Jesus himself spoke of it often. In fact, two-thirds of the parables of Jesus deal with the subject that we're going to be dealing with. And that is the subject of finances, money, wealth, what we do with the things that God has given us. And I've entitled this series, Giving Matters. Giving Matters. You're turning to Matthew chapter number six. And while you're turning there, uh, there's a story of a church secretary who was manning the phones. And she was there at the, the front office one day and got a phone call. And so she answered the phone and she said, hello. A voice on the other line came and said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk to the head hog at the trough. And she said, I'm sorry, sir, could you repeat that? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk to the head honcho at the trough, the head hog. She says, "Um, sir, if you're referring to our pastor, I I would prefer that you show him some respect, that you either call him pastor or reverend, but not a hog. And a couple moments went by, and he said, well, uh, I just want to talk to him because I was considering giving $100,000 to the building fund. She said, I think the big fat pig just walked in. Let me get him for you. (laughs) Now, how many of you know our giving matters? It matters to God. It matters to us. And it matters to others. And so what we do with what God has given us is very important. And, you know, why we give matters. What we give matters where we give matters, how we give matters. Now, let's start today with why we give, because why we give is vitally important to all the other areas of what we're going to be talking about through this series. Because if we give with the wrong motive, the wrong attitude, we will not receive the blessing of God. 
We need to have the blessing of God on our life because that goes far beyond any wealth. That goes far beyond any natural thing. See, the problem with wealth and the problem with giving that many people have is not with money, but rather it's with a mindset. Because people have the wrong mindset about money. They think, oh, well, you preachers are only after money. No, I'm not after your money. I could care less about your money. I like what Peter said, may your money die with you, (laughs) right? I don't need money. I need God. Because when you've got God, he goes beyond natural provision. God didn't need money when he provided for Elijah at the brook. Ravens bringing him meat every night. God didn't need money when Elijah went to a widow and the bin of flour did not dry up run empty and the jar of oil never dried up. God didn't need money when he fed 5,000 people with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. See, God does not need money. God made money. If God needed money, he would make it. He could speak it and all of the resources could come. And in the same way, this church will survive whether you give or don't give. That's not the issue. The issue is, is your heart. And that's where we have to get over a mindset. It's where we have to get past the things in the natural. See, giving starts in the heart. Got to understand this. This is foundational for everything that we're going to be talking about in this series. And so we can't get to part number two, three, and four if we don't start with the heart. Giving starts in the heart. You know, actually, everything that goes on in your life starts in the heart. Before you do anything, there was a thought, there was an emotion, there was a desire, there was something that happened on the inside of you that moved you forward in order to act. Anything that you do with your hands started in your head and dropped down into your heart. Did you know that? Something that goes on in all of our lives, in the soul realm, in the spirit realm, there are things that go on internally that will affect us externally. And if we're going to give how God wants us to give... We want our giving to matter. If we want it to matter to God, we want it to matter to our lives, we want it to matter in eternity, we want to matter in the lives of others, then guess what? We've got to have the right heart. Giving starts in the heart. See, the question for all of us is not how much do you have or what do you like. Sometimes people get all hung up on this because they think that if you have a lot of things on the earth, then you are unspiritual. Well, if that was the case, then the father of faith, Abraham, would have been very unspiritual because he had 318 men that were born in his own house. The man was filthy, stinking rich by our standards today. In fact, Abraham and his nephew Lot had so much wealth that the land that they were living on couldn't even hold the two of them. It couldn't sustain them. They had to split up. That's how much wealth they had. Abraham's son, Isaac, he he must have been very unspiritual because he sowed in a time of famine and reaped a hundredfold. See, the men and women of God throughout the Bible, you can read about it, oftentimes they were the envy of kings because of how much they had. Israel, so wealthy. Solomon must have been very unspiritual. David, all of the kings. See, God places it in his word to show us it's not about how much you have. Sometimes people get down on Christians who have a lot of stuff, who have a lot of wealth, or people who like nice things. Did you know that God likes nice things? Just look around the earth for a second. This place is not ugly. I mean, I know we live in a valley where there's oftentimes smog covering the mountains, but when that stuff clears out and you look, it can take your breath away. Oh my goodness. Look at the expanse. Look at what God made. Go down to the ocean and look across the waters. Look at the horizon. Go to Yosemite. Go to the Redwoods. Go to the Grand Canyon. I know some of you guys are thinking that's just a big hole in the ground. But my goodness, if you get a hold of the magnitude of God. Oh my goodness. It's amazing. God likes nice things and he placed those things in the earth. Just take a look at a flower. Look how much beauty and color and, and, and elegance God places in creation. Go to the zoo and take a look at some of those funky birds. The colors that God wrapped in their feathers. and the I mean, it's like shiny foil that God placed on them. The birds of paradise and, the, and just the detail. God is an artist. He's amazing. God likes nice things. And sometimes people get down on the church. My, my, my middle son, he's such a cool kid. He was talking to me. He said, Dad, you know what? You know what my dream car is? And I said, no, son, what's your dream car? I'm expecting like a Mustang or some, you know, some sort of a muscle car, a Charger or something like that, Challenger, I don't know. He's like, I want a Lambo. A Lambo? Yeah, Lamborghini. Maybe I'd take a Bugatti, you know. I'm going, where did this kid come from? 
Well, his grandfather did grow up in Bel Air. I guess, you know, something's going on. He must have got that gene, you know what I'm saying? Driving around, and so now I'm pointing out, hey, look at there's a Rolls Royce. There's a Bentley. Look at this, bubs. And he's like, yeah, but I want the sports car, you know? I'm like, cool. Dad, I saw a Ferrari on our field trip the other day. That's awesome, bud, you know? And so he's asking me, what's your dream car? You know, I'm not ashamed to tell him. I'm, I'm like, you know what? I, I, give me a Tesla. Give me something. You know what I mean? Like, good for the environment, good for me, man. That's, that's a cool car. But God is not hung up on things. He's not, he doesn't care if you like nice things. It's not a sin to like nice things. Because uh, many people that are in poverty, if you handed them some wealth, they would say, thank you very much. They wouldn't have any question about whether it was spiritual or not. Just saying. I'll get off your toes. See, the question is not how much do you have or what do you like, but rather, where's your treasure? That's the real question. Where is your treasure? See, I could have a nice house. I could have a new car. I could have lots of stuff, and I could yet have no treasure here on the earth. I could have a lot of wealth and still have no treasure here on the earth. Or I could be in deep Poverty with nothing, not even two pennies to rub together, nothing to my name, nothing to leave behind to anyone. They could drop me in a hole in the ground and I could leave this earth with what I brought into this earth, which is nothing. And yet I could still have no treasure in heaven. See, poverty and wealth are not indicators of where your treasure is. That's determined by your heart. Matthew chapter number 6, you guys there? Matthew chapter number 6, we're going to read verse number 19 through verse number 21. Jesus is speaking, by the way, okay? Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. Look at what he says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Everybody say treasures on earth. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and still, I was at a yard sale one time, and there, uh, as we were looking around, a guy came up, and he was kind of excited, and he was looking around, and he was frantic. He was going from, from bin to bin, and from table to table, and rack to rack, and, 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 and the, the, the owner of the house looked at him and said, you know, are you looking for something specific? He goes, I just know there's treasure here somewhere. I just know there's treasure here somewhere. And he's digging through everything. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. And after a little while, the guy left shaking his head, there's no treasure here. No treasure. See, Jesus said, do not lay up treasures for yourself here on the earth. When you look around the earth, don't look for treasure here. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break and steal. Can I tell you something? All of this stuff that you can accumulate, you aren't taken with you when you go. They will bury you in a grave, and I don't care. Somebody got buried in a Cadillac. You know, that's a perfectly good waste of a nice car. Somebody got buried with a trailer full of their stuff. Somebody ought to go dig that up and give it to someone to use. Because guess what? They ain't using it. All of the pharaohs who were buried with all of their wealth, you know what's happening to them now, right? They're just parading that stuff from museum to museum. You can't take it with you. And guess what? Even if, if it was better for it to be preserved, eventually it's going to rust, it's going to rot. And can I tell you this? It's all going to burn. It came out of the earth. It's all from the dust. And guess what? My Bible says that it will all melt with fervent heat. When all, it's dust, it's dirt, and it's all going to burn. Verse number 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Everybody say treasures in heaven. That's where we want to lay up treasures, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be will be also, if I looked at your bank statements, I could tell where your heart is at. Some of you guys, your heart might be in Starbucks. Every morning, religiously, same time, same drink, same $6, right? Spending way too much for a cup of coffee. But your heart would be at Starbucks. Some of you would be in Saks Fifth Avenue. Some of you guys, your heart would be in your house and all the, impair, uh, the, the improvements and the repairs and all the things that you're doing there. Some of you guys, your heart would be in a car, Some of you guys, your heart would be at Napa Auto Parts because you're constantly getting something new, some new toy, something like that. Some of you guys, your hearts would be in sports. Some of you guys, your heart would be in in recreation, in vacations. But see, there are many of us who, when you look at our bank statements, you'd see every time we get paid on the first, my heart is in the Lord. 
My heart is in the things of God. My heart is in the tithe. My heart is in the offering. My heart is in helping people. You'd be able to see where the heart was at. Why? Because you can see where the money was spent. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And there's an account in heaven because there are some things that we're going to be able to take with us into eternity. Do you know that you can take the Word of God with you into eternity? It's eternal, right? The Word of God is eternal. And so when you use the Word of God in your life, that's a treasure for you in heaven. That whatever you do with the Word. The Bible says that your faith is tested as gold, right? Your faith is something precious. Your faith is something that when you use your faith, there will be an account of what you did in heaven. The words that you speak. God says that he makes a written account of everything that the righteous say. And we will be brought into judgment for every idle word, so watch your mouth. But when you speak words, the Bible says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is an aptly spoken word. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. There are treasures when you speak good things, when you start to declare the will and the counsel of God, when you encourage others, when you speak what it is that God would have you to say. Guess what else? The souls of man are eternal. And anybody that you get saved, anybody that you minister to, anybody that you encourage in the things of God, the Bible says that they are the jewels on your crowns, that they are like precious stones on that crown that you will cast at the feet of Jesus. There are things that we can invest in that will be eternal. And our generosity is something that comes up before God as a memorial in heaven. It is something that impacts eternity. Are you guys listening today? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, poverty and wealth are both conditions of the heart. We need to understand this. Poverty and wealth are not amounts. They're not stuff in your wallet. They're not determined by how much money you have or how many things that you have. But rather, these are conditions of the heart, not a condition of the wallet, not a condition of the substance. See, poverty in the heart will actually bring its surroundings down to its level. Okay? Now, I I need you guys to go somewhere with me and think about this, because I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to prove this to you. Poverty of the heart will bring its surroundings down to its level. Let me prove this to you. How many people have you heard of that won the lottery? Oh, they're set for life. They're going to get a thousand, you know, a thousand a week for the rest of their life. They're going to get 10,000 a a, a week the rest of their life, right? And they'll never get paid out all the interest, all that, because they'll never run out of money, Right? And in a couple of months, they're filing for bankruptcy. Why? Because what was on the inside of them was poverty, and it could not sustain the blessing and the the abundance that was coming to it. How many lottery winners do you know that accumulated a bunch of stuff, and yet here they are on some stupid talk show talking about how they divorced their wife, they hate their kids, and they've shunned all of their family because everybody wants money. Why? Because the poverty inside of them brought its surroundings down to its level. How many celebrities, you could write a who's who list of celebrities, of CEOs, uh, of the wealthy and the famous that have killed themselves, been addicted to drugs and had to go through multiple rehabs, or who have been in jail Why? Because the condition of their heart brought their surroundings down to the level that they were at. Heard a story of a man who was in ancient China during the days of the emperors, and he was a, you know, poor man and and, and wasn't very nice and grumbled all the time and, and didn't have very much, just a bowl of rice to live on every day. One day he was sitting by the roadside eating his bowl of rice, and he heard hoofs of horses coming towards him rapidly. And he knew that these horses were going to kick dust all up over him. And so he pulled his shirt up over his head and put his bowl of rice underneath his shirt and continued to eat. And he heard the hoof prints coming faster and faster, louder and louder, until they came right up next to him. And they came to a screeching halt right there in front of him. So he waited for the dust to settle. And after a while, he pulled his eyes up out of his shirt and he looked up. And wouldn't you know it was the emperor himself in a massive golden carriage led by beautiful horses And the emperor stepped down out of the carriage, and he came to him. And he said, what is that you have under your shirt? And he grumbled, and he pulled his bowl of rice up out of his shirt. And he says, oh, I'm very hungry. Would you share some of your rice with me? And the man carefully and methodically pulled out three grains of rice. The emperor put his hand out, and he scooped him to the emperor's hand. The emperor ate the three grains of rice, and he said, thank you very much. Now I have something to give to you. 
And he went back to the carriage and he pulled out a golden box with a lock on it. He unlocked it and he opened it up and he carefully measured out three golden coins. And he handed the man the three golden coins. He thanked him. He got back in the chariot and he left. And the man sat there staring at the coins and he wailed and he said, I should have gave him the whole bowl. See, poverty in the heart will bring its surroundings down to its level. In fact, Jesus was talking about a guy who built barns for himself, built up everything for himself, and he was not rich towards God, and God called him a fool and said, will your soul not be required of you this night? And Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 21, in the New Living Translation, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. It's foolish to measure out carefully and methodically three little great, God, this is all you get. See, you could even give your tithe with the wrong heart and still have a poverty attitude. You can give to God. You can give lots of money and yet still have the wrong heart. But giving starts in the heart. See, kingdom wealth in the heart will bring its surroundings up to its level. And that's what today is all about. In the book, Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, written by Chris Vallotton, he has a God's definition of wealth. And he writes these words. He says that wealth is the ability, the resources, the strength, and the wisdom to create positive outcomes the resources, the ability, and the strength to create positive outcomes in the midst of lack, poverty, and or emptiness. That wealth is a light in the darkness, healing in sickness, prosperity in poverty, wholeness in brokenness, favor in obscurity, love for the unlovely, beauty for ashes, and victors among victims. Wealth is a can-do attitude. It's a more-than-enough mindset. It is a nothing-is-impossible belief system. Wealth is radical generosity, extraordinary compassion, sacrificial giving. That Wealth is a profound humility. It's always thankful and never jealous. It does not brag. It celebrates others and it looks to the future. That is the kingdom wealth mindset. Now we see this mindset in the great men and women of God all throughout the Bible. But I think the greatest example of the kingdom wealth mindset is Jesus himself. Right? Because the Bible tells us, and I want you to turn there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, about Jesus. And in fact, when you take a look at the context of what 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and chapter number 9 are talking about, it's talking about financial giving. It's talking about giving of resources to help someone else. Donations and generosity within the church. And in the midst of a conversation about money, the Apostle Paul writes these words in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 9. For you know. Now, when the Bible says you know, you ought to know. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is grace? Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it, right? It's the power of God in me to do what is truth demands of me. That's what grace is. Grace is God's strength, God's power, God's ability on my behalf to do what I couldn't do in the natural, Right? So he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, well, grace must just be talking about salvation. No, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about money. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and wasn't Jesus rich? Jesus was one with the Father. If Jesus wanted gold, all he had to do was pick up a pebble off the street because the streets are made of gold. The crystal sea, crystal sea. Massive pillars in heaven, the wealth of the king. I mean, like nothing that this earth has ever seen. My goodness. Emerald all around the throne, an emerald rainbow. Wow. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. Now, what does that mean for Jesus? Jesus disrobed himself of the glory and the union and unity that he had with the Father. And he wrapped himself in human flesh. The Bible said he experienced everything we experienced. He experienced pain. He experienced sorrow. He experienced every bit of humanity. He was tired. He wept. He bled. He was bruised. He was broken. He was rejected. That 
is the poverty that Jesus experienced here on the earth. For your sakes, he became poor. Jesus told people, foxes have holes and the birds of air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, did Jesus ever not have a place to sleep? No, he always had a place to sleep, didn't he? He always had a resource. Look, at it. it says that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, the poverty was an external poverty, right? It was the form of God that he disrobed himself from, and he emptied himself of that wealth to become poor. What does that mean? It means he wrapped himself in humanity. He, he robed himself in our weaknesses, and he experienced those things in the flesh, in the days of his flesh, and he suffered while he was here on the earth. But the kingdom wealth was inside of Jesus, because everywhere Jesus went, his surroundings came up to where he was. Jesus, you've been preaching a long time, preacher. The people are weary. I think the disciples were really saying, we're weary. We heard this message before. Last time you preached it for eight hours, right? Send the people away that they can go get something to eat. Jesus says, well, even even the villages around, they can't sustain them, right? There's too many people, and, and they might grow weary on the way. You give them something to eat. What's the disciples' response? The disciples' response is poverty, right? We don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. All we got is five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, make them sit down. Why? Because the wealth of the kingdom was about to be expressed, right? Here he is. He gives thanks to the Father. He breaks the bread. He distributes it. And 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, probably 10 to 12,000. Some have even estimated 14 or 15,000 people ate. Why? Because the wealth of the kingdom that was within Jesus was expressed. He brought the place around him up to where the kingdom was at. Here's Peter. Peter's on the outside, and he's just hanging out, right? A couple of guys come up. Hey, does your, does your leader pay taxes? Peter's like, yeah. Hey, Jesus, do we pay taxes? You ever done that, right? Yeah, what, what's it to you? Hey, hey, by the way, do we do that? Jesus says, Peter, what do you think? When there's a king, do his children pay taxes, or does he take it from the servants, right? From the, the common folk. He says, well, from the people. He says, then the sons are exempt, right? They don't have to pay taxes. Peter says, yeah, sounds good to me. But Jesus says, no, 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 wait, wait. For their conscience, go fishing, throw a line out, you'll catch a fish, in it you'll find a coin, pay your taxes and mine. See, wealth has no problem going the extra mile and covering someone else's offense. Wealth has no problem paying its taxes. Come on, somebody. I don't have to pay taxes. I'm a son of the king. I'm exempt from, I'm not of this world, right? No, you better pay your taxes because the Bible tells you to. And it has no problem paying taxes. Has no problem going the extra mile for someone else. See, Jesus always brought his surroundings up to where he was at. And when you have the kingdom within you, wherever you go, there may be lack, there may be need, there may be deep poverty all around you. But guess what? You will bring the surroundings up to where the kingdom is inside of you. That's kingdom wealth. That's the kingdom wealth mentality and mindset. James chapter 2, verse number 5, God expresses this. Take a look at it with me in your Bible. Turn with me to the book of James. Right after Hebrews, you'll find James. James chapter number 2, and it's talking about don't give the wealth preference. Don't, don't just only go after them. Don't just give them the best seats and tell the poor man you sit over here. Look at what he says in James chapter 2, verse number 5. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world now, that's us. doesn't matter how much you have. See, the world has its own system of wealth. We don't operate in that system any longer, and God has now chosen us. So if you came in here today and you wondered, man, I don't really have that much. Well, listen, you've got the choice of God on your life. God has chosen you. Has God not chosen the poor of this world, look at this, to be rich in faith? Rich in faith. See, your faith will take you far beyond what any amount of money could ever take you. Faith will bring the money. Faith will bring the resource. Faith will bring the provision. Faith will bring about the miraculous. Faith will bring about the supernatural. Faith is what you need. You don't need money. You need to believe God. God will take care of the finances. He'll take care of the rest. To be rich in faith, but not only there, and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. See, we, we're sitting around looking for more money, and God says, you have the kingdom. What do you need money for? 
You've got every resource available to you. You've got every strength. You've got all the wisdom. And guess what? The money will follow. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek the kingdom. Seek the wealth that God has given you. Fear not, little flock, for it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And when we're sitting there staring at, I don't have any money. I guess I can't do anything. No, you've got the kingdom. Bring your surroundings up to where you're at. See, true prosperity starts with giving. If prosperity started with receiving, then we'd have to wait for someone else to give us something to start the process. We'd just be sitting there, well, I don't have anything. I guess I, guess I can't do anything. No, God gave you everything, the Bible says, richly to enjoy. He's already given us so much. He's given us wealth. He's given us time. He's given us talent. He's given us treasure. He's given us kingdom. He's given us life. He's given us the gospel. He's given us energy. He's given us resource. He's given us so many things. And Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. See, the hindrance to our receiving is that we have not yet released what God has given us. When you release what's in your hand, it opens you up to be in a position to receive because whatever you sow, you will also, oh, come on, play with me today. You'll also what? Reap. That means that if you give someone time, interest, attention, in a greater measure, they're going to give you time, interest, and attention. That if you give of your talent, if you use your energy, someone's going to give you their talent and their energy. If you give someone love and affection, they're going to give you love and affection. Let me show this to you in the Word. Luke chapter number 6. Once again, the Sermon on the Mount. We were in Matthew chapter 6 before. Now Luke chapter number 6. Same sermon. Jesus is talking in Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 38. Take a look at it with me. In Luke chapter 6, verse number 38. says this. It says, give and it will be given to you. Notice it didn't say receive and then give. God expects us to initiate the process of our prosperity. God says, give and it will be given to you. Now, this is in the middle of something talking about judgments. So if you give judgments, you're going to receive judgments in greater measure than you gave them. Because whatever you sow, you reap in greater measure. Any farmer knows this principle. You sow one seed and you get multiple seeds back, multiple fruit back. So whatever you give will be given to you. If you sow money, hello, eventually you're going to reap money. In greater measure. Now, that, this is not a slot machine mentality. This is not put in a quarter, pull the lever, and down come the blessings. No. This is work hard. This is do what you need to do. And we'll talk about this next week with the tithe. Because it also takes time. I planted some seeds in my garden. I'm going to eat those fruit probably in September or October. Even though I planted them last month. Why am I not eating them now? Because it takes time. We know this in the natural, but then when it comes to our money, I want it now. Give and it will be given to you. Look at this. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. And running over will it be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now think about this for a second. If I took out a teaspoon and I said, here you go. Someone's going to take out a teaspoon they're going to pat it down, shake it together, and they're going to make sure it's running over, and they're going to go, here you go. Now, I may like that, right? Ooh, I got a little bit more than a teaspoon back. So I take out a shovel, right? And I take my shovel, and I go, here you go. And they take out a shovel, right? And they stomp it down, press it together, shake it up, make sure that it's tamped down. And then they make sure it's running over, and they give it back to me. Ooh, I like that. So I get the wheelbarrow, right? Hey, all right, load up the wheelbarrow. Give that wheelbarrow. They go and they get their wheelbarrow. They stamp it down. They make sure they shake it together so that there's no air pockets, right? It's running over as they bring it to me, and they dump that wheelbarrow. Oh, I really like that. So I go and I get the truck, and I load up the truck, and I back up the truck. Do 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 do. Well, guess what's going to happen? They're going to go and get the truck, and they're going to load up the truck, and they're going to press down the truck. They're going to shake it together, make sure that it's running over, and then doot, 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 they're going to back up the truck. 
See, that's the principle of God. With the same measure you use, you know what the measure really is? The heart. That's the measuring cup. You can give grudgingly with a little teaspoon attitude. Mm, here you go. Or, do, 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 do. here you go. Because it's not about amount. It's about heart. That's where prosperity really is, is inside of you. See, Abraham and Sarah launched out not knowing where they were going, but they knew where they could not stay. God told them, I want you to get out of the land of your fathers and go to a place that I will show you. Today, I hope that you've gotten a picture of a kingdom, a kingdom that has wealth, a kingdom that has resource, a place called prosperity. And you may not know how to get there. We're going to travel the journey as we go throughout the next couple of weeks. I'm going to show you some steps along the road. You may not understand everything that's going to happen, all the different things that have to take place for you to get there, but guess what? You know where you cannot stay. You cannot stay in poverty any longer. You cannot stay in the ways that you were raised in. You cannot stay in the past or the way of the economy of this world. You cannot stay there any longer. It's time to launch out and follow God to a land flowing with milk and honey. See, the reward of obedience from the heart far outweighs the risk of losing your earthly security. Elon Musk, many of you guys know him. I mentioned a Tesla earlier. He's the, the CEO of Tesla. He's currently uh, overseeing a company called The Boring Company. They're boring under Los Angeles, digging holes. Why are they doing that? Because he was sitting in traffic and he hated traffic and he didn't want to sit in traffic any longer. And so while he was sitting there, he started dreaming, started thinking, well, you know what? If we had a system of tunnels underneath Los Angeles that spun around and you could go anywhere, you get on a little skate in your car and that skate takes you at 130 miles an hour. You know what? You could get from West LA to LAX in six minutes if we did that. Wow. Wow. No wonder the guy is wealthy according to the world's standards. He went and he did a TED Talk, and the TED Talk moderator started talking to him about the SpaceX program and launching this rocket. By the way, you can reuse this rocket. Many of the other rockets you can't reuse. His you can reuse. He's an amazingly brilliant man. He started talking about colonizing Mars, not just reaching Mars, colonizing Mars. He wants people to live on Mars. And the moderator asked him, why do you want to colonize Mars? Now, he didn't say so that we could be the first so that we could touch down, so that we could see if there's Martians. He didn't say any of that stuff. He didn't say because we're running, running out of room on the planet. We are not running out of room on the planet, right? Just go out to the desert. There's plenty of vacant land that you can buy cheap. Here's the reason why. He said, because I want to wake up every morning with hope. He had to have something to look forward to. There was a goal that he had to have to keep him moving forward. For some of you today, thinking about prosperity and wealth, might seem like colonizing Mars to you. But I want you to get a picture of the kingdom so that every morning you can wake up with hope of a future. Every morning you can wake up and say, God is prospering. God's doing something in my life. It may look like it's far off. I may not know where I'm going, but guess what? I have a hope for tomorrow. God wants to bless you in your financial future. Can you say amen to that? I want to introduce you to one of our staff members. His name is Troy. Troy Bracken, great man of God. He's wonderful. This is Troy and his family. There they are all wearing their buffalo plaid and uh, liked by Roth Dan right there. That's me on the bottom there. So anyways, um, I like Troy. I like his family and I like his posts. Troy posted this picture of him and his family. His kids are cute as a button. I mean, they've got these big blue eyes and, and they're just adorable. Blonde hair and uh, just a great man. He, he says this in the post. He says, I went from someone who had no job homeless, on drugs, in and out of jail, no schooling, no one having my back, no future, no hope, no real friends. Now I am truly blessed beyond measure. I got married to the most beautiful, smart, to die for, an absolute best woman in the world, hands down, the most beautiful, smart, caring children. I bought my first house, cars, a good career, doing something I love. I'm glad he included that because he's our IT guy here. Doing something I love, great friends, and the best church and family in the world. How might you ask? All I did was make a conscious decision to believe in God and trust him to take care of me and my family. The road hasn't been the easiest, but it wasn't because of God. It was because I am still human and make mistakes. However, I've learned from those mistakes and make sure not to make them again. Never stop learning what God is teaching you. To anyone out there thinking that they are hopeless, please learn from my life 
and my experiences. You are worth way more than you know. God loves and cares about you. Now it's time to start caring about yourself. Trust in Him and know your value. Today, what did we learn? We learned that prosperity starts in the heart and that giving is a matter of the heart and that we need to give with the right heart and that in order to initiate the process that our prosperity starts with our giving because if you give, you will receive. Give and it shall be given to you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today, Lord, that we've gotten a picture of a future. We've gotten a picture of hope. Lord, we've gotten a picture of the kingdom wealth and the prosperity that you have, God, not the substitute that we find in the world, not the distortions or the perversions we've seen in the past, but Lord, true prosperity and wealth, God. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us that's a Christian in this room today, Lord God, that God, that our surroundings would not dictate to us how our life is going to be, but that according to the kingdom wealth within us, Lord, that we would bring our surroundings up to where the wealth is within us. God, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement said... Amen. Come on, if you got something from the Word of the Lord, give God a great big praise today. Amen. Hey, today, I don't think I need to say anything about giving. We're going to receive the tithe and the offering unto the Lord today. Can we do that with joy? Can we celebrate that?